Hi, it's Kim, Hockey Mom RD, and welcome to my weekend video bonus. I'm going to show you how I make my homemade waffles. In this bowl right here, we have one and three quarters cups of flour, one tablespoon of baking powder, and I sprinkled in some cinnamon because my sons like the flavor of cinnamon. Then take a whisk and whisk it up. That helps to aerate the ingredients and sift it without using a sifter. In the next bowl, I have a half a cup of oil, two egg yolks, and one and three quarters cups of milk. The egg yolks provide the lecithin to emulsify the water that's in the milk with the oil, and it becomes one complete emulsified mixture. And then in my last bowl, I have the two egg whites, which you can see there's not much liquid in here right now, but after I beat them up with my rotary beater, which I love, you'll see how much they increase. Okay, so in this big bowl, I have transferred the flour, the salt, and the baking powder, so I have a larger space to blend my ingredients. You always want to add liquid to dry, so I'm adding the egg mixture, egg oil and milk mixture to the flour. You whisk it up, and then you're going to fold in your egg whites. And you can see that the egg whites have greatly increased in volume. That's because when you beat the egg whites, you're going to be you're adding air to the egg whites, which aids in increasing volume. Now the batter does not have to be completely smooth. And then you're going to fold in your egg whites because you do not want to break the air bubbles that you've trapped. These air bubbles are going to help with the volume of your mixture. So you get nice fluffy waffles. So complete this step and then all you have to do is use a ladle and transfer them to your favorite waffle maker. Enjoy! We spell it P I M P S. Yes, P I M P S. In other words, pimps. Yes, we pimp for Coach Chick. We're pimping his programs and products and such. That said, do you know what a membership website is? In the case of CoachChick.com, it's a site where members have access to all sorts of hockey advice. And, Coach Chick is always available to help them. And his members are, coaches, parents of youth players and even adult rec players. Oh, and roller hockey folks, too. And, because Coach Chick isn't too smart, he has lots of special guest writers also. Oh, brother. Well, I know he has a goalie coach, mental trainers, strength specialists, and many more. And, besides hundreds of articles, there's audio to listen to, and tons of videos. Most of all, the coach has seen it all, and, he doesn't want his members to make the same painful mistakes, others had to learn the hard way. And, what should such information cost? Oh, I'd say it's thousands of dollars per year. No, God, jeepers. Well? Since the early 1970s, high-level North American coaches have paid serious attention 
to the unusual training concept used by European trainers. The idea of dry land training has already benefited thousands and thousands of Canadian and U.S. players in that it offers teams and individuals the opportunity to practice without the need for costly ice time. Since 1979, my students have profited greatly from Russian, Czech, Finnish and other European inspirations. And more recently, they've really expanded their puck skills through the use of Swedish stick handling balls. Here are just a few benefits as I see them. Being small and lightweight, they allow quick stick actions. Actually, because they're a little lively, they almost force a player to react with rather quick hands. And, while a golf ball might provide the same results, I like these wooden ones because they're a lot less bouncy and perhaps a lot safer. We use two different versions in this video. I recommend the smaller, livelier one for off-season work, while the slightly larger ball is closer to the weight of a puck and thusly better for a serious ice hockey player's in-season training. Now, as you're ready to gain incredible stick handling skills, here are a few things you should know. Only a short, lightweight, well-balanced stick is going to make gains possible. Apply the same principle to all of the other gear involved in stick handling, using lightweight gloves and ensuring that no other protective gear restricts or burdens the hands, arms, or upper body. Ultimately, your goal is for quickness in each of the following moves. But, at the same time, try to treat the ball or puck gently, with an aim towards developing nice, soft hands. Know that, within our game, puck handling is a complex skill that usually requires simultaneously dealing with numerous other physical challenges. And, towards this end, I've included a number of asymmetric drills that call for stick handling while also performing some other kind of movement. Trust me on the science of this program in that the more you perform these off-ice actions, the more they'll transfer to your on-ice or roller hockey game. Lastly, I purposely film most of the following exercises in a small area of our office. The reason I wanted you to appreciate how little space is needed and that there should be very little in the way of your achieving incredible stick handling skills. This is Mike Bracco. Thanks for looking at this preview of Hockey Skating Coaching Certification Level 1. In the Level 1 certification, there is a seven-chapter webinar. There are two videos of me coaching skating clinics. The first one is me working with a group of hockey coaches after we had done an in-person skating coaching certification. And then the second video is of me working with a bunch of players, doing a skating clinic with a, a group of peewee players. There are two articles on skating to read, one that is written by myself on the biomechanics of skating, and a very elegant paper written by Marion Alexander from the University of Manitoba on the biomechanics of arm movement in skating. You will also get a copy of my Game Performance Skating Drills DVD, and at the end there is a written test for the certification. The chapter outline is as follows. Chapter one, we talk about skating in general terms. We talk about 
If skating is objective, is it subjective? Can we use our philosophy on skating or is, there, is it governed by certain laws like Newton's laws of physics? Chapter two is the biomechanics of skating with specific reference to a wide stride and how the research shows and observation of hockey players shows that a wide stride is a characteristic of fast skaters. Chapter three is the biomechanics of skating as it relates to uh, fast players having a low, quick recovery and getting on the inside edge quickly. We review research from the University of Alberta women's hockey team. Chapter four is arm movement. And we talk about the biomechanics of arm movement and how many hockey coaches and many power skating coaches are te teaching arm movement wrong. Number five, chapter five is the myth of power skating. And here we go through a lot of myths and misconceptions that are taught by power skating coaches. Chapter six is a review of research on game performance skating characteristics of NHL forwards. And chapter seven, we finish with the skating analysis of some hockey players. When you have completed the certification, you get a certificate of completion and you're designated as a certified hockey skating coach level one through the Hockey Institute. Who is the certification for? Any hockey skating coach, anyone wanting to be a hockey skating coach, hockey coaches wanting to further the knowledge of how to teach or coach skating, even strength and conditioning coaches wanting to better understand how to train hockey players, and of course, ringette coaches. Please check my website, hockeyinstitute.org, for when the certification will be live. And please email me if you have any questions at bracco at hockeyinstitute.org. So I hope to be talking to you soon. Thanks. All right, coaches, we've got break turn madness here. We've got Timu Solani madness. So we're going to change this just a tiny bit. We've got the same cone course through the neutral zone, but as it relates to what I saw Timu Solani do several times, he races down the wing, does a break turn to get the defenseman going in deep, and then comes out and goes into the offensive zone, or he's in the offensive zone, gets the defenseman deep, and then he goes right to the net. So we're going to have the same cone course through the, through the neutral zone. So you've got the same teaching cues through the neutral zone. First one is a sharp turn, second one you're getting your foot out, and then at the far end, acceleration, acceleration, get that foot out, go around the cone or go around the player, and then go right to the net. Then I want you to accelerate as fast as you can, do a break, turn around there, and then take a shot there. You understand what to do, Cal? Yeah. Alright, let's go for it, man. Okay, get this foot out. Break, turn around that foot. He's just about getting it, guys. He's just about getting it. Now, accelerate fast. Accelerate fast. Okay, get this turn around there. That's it. Now, go hard to the net. Hard to the net. Keep your feet moving. Keep your feet moving, Kyle. Perfect. I swear, that might have been like Timo Solani. That was good. Dennis Chigas Olas. The Nature of Our Game, ranks with other high-level essays, authored by the likes of Gladwell, Percival, and Coyle. It's an in-depth study of our game, it's about the challenges players face in the heat of battle, and it's about the things that influence the way players need to train, both off, and on the ice. Get it now, and be well armed, to answer almost any question, that arises about our game.
rock some hose pulls, put your hand through the loop. All right, after you got your bands linked together, I recommend linking bands together so you get a great variability in band strength so you can really stretch this out. Go ahead, hook it on there. Opposite hand goes underneath. You're loading over top. Now you make sure you get some rotation involved with it because as you pull up, I'm pulling through. Now my right arm is doing most of the pulling. Left arm is assisting as needed. And I'm really gonna make sure I get through a full range of motion while I'm doing hose pulls. Guys, hose pulls are gonna rock your mid back, but you're also gonna notice they're gonna be a great hip exercise, great flexibility exercise for your hips, especially if you get some rotation involved with it. Get your hose pulls going. Time to get after your posterior chain, and what we're gonna do is some hip attached straight leg deadlifts. You're gonna notice over here, I've got my band attached to my bar. All right, I'm gonna step into that. I'm gonna make sure it's placed at my hips. You're gonna notice the angle is a little bit down, so it's pulling me back a little bit. So when we go into the straight leg deadlift portion of our exercise, it's really driving me down. We're gonna take a second band. This is why you always wanna have additional band straight ground. We're gonna put it underneath our arch of our feet. And you got a couple of options here. You can grab the loops with your hands, or you can slide your hands through the loops that way, it's hooked onto your wrist and you don't have to worry about your grip strength failing you. We're going straight leg deadlifts, guys. Now, I'm getting a horizontal vector force, which is gonna really drive me back into that good hip hinge. And I've got a vertical vector force that I gotta pull against. Posterior chain is gonna absolutely get on fire with this exercise, guys. And you're gonna love it because look at the flexibility. Look at the power you gotta generate through both in a horizontal fashion, but as well as a vertical fashion. Straight leg deadlifts. Hook up a band to your hips. Let's go ahead and get after it. Okay, let's rock some crossover setup squats. Here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna get into your crossover setup. Lock yourself in, all right? You make sure, cross it over. Now here's the key to getting into it. Make sure you push the band down to your foot. And, not, and bring your foot up, all right? So you wanna go ahead and push down and bring your foot up and step into it. That's much easier to do than going ahead and bending over and hooking it on your foot. So step it down and step it in, all right? We're ready to go. We're gonna knock it out. I like the stool back there because it gives me a good depth perception. Hands gotta get up here. We're dropping down, we're coming back up. This is a great squat exercise, all right? to do in a one minute fashion to really load the system and keep tension on the system for a long time. You wanna add a little bit more, take that third band, step onto it, put yourself into a rack position with it as well, and now you can really load the system. And being honest with you, this is a really easy system to get into. When you rest, drop it down, hey, if you want, and you're taking a minute, you can hook it over, if you unhook it, hook it so that it comes over top of your foot. So now, recover, tension is off the system. When you're ready to go ahead and get onto your next system, it'll take you about 15 seconds. Hook it in, hook it in, and you're ready to go. If you wanna go ahead and load this one on up as well, you wanna go ahead and just put yourself in there, get it onto your feet, bring it up to your shoulders, up you come, and you're ready to go. One minute. I'm telling you guys, you're gonna love how this goes ahead and loads you up, but you need some bands to be able to do it, all right? And preferably, you're gonna need to go a little heavier. Enjoy some crossover squats. Key to push-ups and getting the most out of them is making sure you're doing it well. That's why I like assisted push-ups. All right, and I'm gonna show you a unique setup that you can go with assisted push-ups. Actually, I'm gonna show you a couple of combinations of them. You're gonna see, first of all, I got my band utility strap hooked up onto my door. It's important that I hook it up in a high position so that I, hit, I get the assistance more in a vertical fashion than a horizontal fashion. First setup you can go ahead and do, and you've seen me do this before, is just hook it into your waist. All right, take yourself down, and you've got your assisted push-ups right there. All the way down, all the way up. Now, that assistance is gonna help the person that has a little bit of weakness to their core, and that's the reason their push-ups struggle. Now, if you've got shoulder blade weakness and stability issues, 
mean, your shoulder blades just don't hold you and stabilize well. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take a black band and look at hook, look at hook it into, excuse me, hook it into the purple band. From there, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to create a simple harness. I'm just going to hook this hand through, and I'm going to hook this hand through. Now the assistance is going to be on to my shoulder girdle. I'm going to go down into the same push-up position, and I'm going to go all the way down, all the way up. Now, why do I want to do assisted push-ups if I'm really strong with them? Well, here's the deal. I want to put the body under tension for a long period of time. Now, some of you may be able to go ahead and do uh, regular active push-ups. That's awesome. Go ahead and do that. But if you can't and you want to do push-ups for a longer period of time, assistance is a great way to do it. Now, for you guys that are way overachievers and you want to really rock your push-ups under some serious tension, take the band loose, hook the hand around one end, hook the hand around the other, and put yourself down. And now we're going to rock one-minute push-ups against resistance. All right. I'm telling you. Those are brutal, but you're going to find they're very effective, especially at developing that locking out and stabilization at the end, which a lot of push-up people lack. So there you go. You got multiple variations to go ahead and do push-ups. There's no reason now you can't do them. Go ahead, assist yourself, resist yourself, or just do them actively, however you want to do it.
welcome to Talking Hockey with John and Howie. Here to keep you up to date with what's going on around the NHL. Howie, how are you doing? Not too bad, not too bad. Good, good. Um, a lot of stuff happening uh, right now. A lot of the divisions and very are very tight right now. Um, we are yeah. halfway through the season and a lot of... There's nobody really standing out above anybody else. <laughs> At least from what I know. <laughs> um, we do have a, a couple big dates coming up. We have the All-Star Weekend coming up on... January 26th through the 28th. And, and no celebrity coaches this point. That's right. At least that's, I don't see that. It, <laughs> it's kind of sad. Um, also, we have coming up uh, fairly soon, next month, is the NHL trade deadline, which will be very, very interesting to see. Um how some of this will play out um, with as tight as everybody is. Yeah, right was, yeah, with the trade deadline, teams I'm curious about seeing who makes moves. It's going to be pretty much everyone in the middle of the pack in the central. Pittsburgh and Montreal are the teams, and even Edmonton are the teams I'm going to be watching to see what moves they make. Right, and, and speaking of Pittsburgh, uh, they have been kind of a disappointment this year. Yeah, offensively, I mean, they're just not uh, doing what they normally do. Well, even defensively, I mean, they, they got a goal differential of minus 12, which is highly unusual to see from them. Right. I, mean, they're, I mean, they're still within their division, I mean, granted. But, yeah, they're just not the typical Pittsburgh Penguins you see on the ice. This right. makes you wonder if uh, they regret not protecting the flurry, maybe. And speaking of Flurry, uh, he has been playing really, really well. Um, and that's the team on the West that's really a, a big surprise. Is yeah, the league -wise, yeah, league wise, they're the biggest surprise. And it's just, they just, for some reason, just keep winning, especially they, at home. They are They've, good. They are like, uh, good. They've lost. Two games at home, I believe, is what it is. Mm. Yeah. And yeah, they just—they're fun to watch. Granted, I've been watching them; they're fun to watch. But it makes makes you wonder if it opens up a whole other can of worms, only because as good as they are, mm. is a sign of with the continuing expansion and talk of expansion. Is this a sign of the thinning of the talent within the league? I, I don't know. Thinning out is what it is. I, 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 I think it might be a balance of talent. I, you just don't see though. You just don't see those uh, dynasty teams anymore. No, not like you used to. No. Not like you had year after year would dominate. You you don't see that anymore. But is that because of the thinning? Yeah. It is so spread out. Well, we shall see. Yeah. In the, the only thing I can say for thinning is it makes it more interesting because it's open to everyone every year and there's not going to be your obvious teams going in, but still yeah. raises concern. And we that's a subject we will bring up on our next podcast or one very soon. So with that, Howie, uh, we will say goodbye and see you next time right here on Talking Hockey with John and Howie. We bid you adieu. Okay. Programming is brought to you by Local Video Mag.